Well, good morning, Bethlehem Covenant Church. Thanks for joining us here on this Sunday, September 12th. Glad that you joined us, and thank you to Wilma for welcoming us into our service here with beautiful song. All of those songs had the connection of the blood of Jesus Christ. And uh, so nothing but the blood and all those other things. Beautiful songs uh, that she, uh, a compilation that she put together, uh, old hymns there. And so thank you for opening us, Wilma. Um, as we gather today, you know, this is uh, the day after the 20th anniversary of September 11th. And uh, so as we gather for worship, we, we think about that. We, we maybe consider uh, praying uh, uh, prayers regarding that. Um, on that day, 20 years ago, 3,000 were killed, 6,000 were injured, 403 of those killed were first responders. Um, a startling statistic I learned this week uh, that F Brown University study did, which is that about 900,000 people have died since 9-11. Um, whether U.S. military, allied fighters, civilians, humanitarian workers, all in response again to the tragedy of that day. Um, Billy Graham, when he uh, uh, spoke at the National Cathedral the week following 9-11, he uh, called people to have hope. Uh, to, he was hoping for a new spirit within our country and a spiritual renewal and revival in America. Uh, because if you remember, we all came together for a while um, after 9-11 and uh, put our differences aside. And then he called us to repent of our sins and rebuild um, on a solemn foundation, trusting in God. And whenever there's tragedy, we do that. And he, he said that we would pray that we would feel the loving arms of God around us. And we, he would, we would know that he will never forsake us as we trust in him. And so these may be some things on our mind today as we gather uh, for worship, praying for this. We kind of need a bit of a spiritual renewal in our country and world again, needing coming together. Um, and uh, we need to pray for our leaders still and, and pray for, uh, again, against the violence all around the world. And uh, so as we, we pray a prayer for those who are grieving still, um, and uh, the tragedies that changed our country and us. Um, we, uh, we ask God to continue to provide hope and uh, to lead us to deeper places with him today. Um, a few announcements as we begin today as well. We're going to begin collecting this week and throughout the next month for Community Closet. The ministry that we do that provides clothing to our, our district, uh, to kids and their families in need. We're collecting underwear, socks, and laundry soap. If you would like to uh, provide all those, of course, new ones. And um, if you wanted to, pr to bring those to the church, we're going to have a big bin set up. We'll be collecting those. We're going to have a newcomer's night for all the new people who've joined us in the last while and want to hear more about our church and what it means to be more apart, and we want to get to know you as well. And that is going to be on Sunday, September 26th, so two weeks from tonight at 7 p.m. at me and Carrie's house across the parking lot. And uh, so we invite you to come to that. There's a women's conference happening at our camp, Covenant Cedars. It's going to be October 1 through 3rd. I heard there's up to 15 different women in our church going to go. And which is a wonderful thing. If you're interested in going, uh, contact the church office or there's a sign up sheet in the foyer as well. And then our college student of the week, we do that every week. Um, and we, we put their picture up during our church service and their, their address in the bulletin. And, and I've been forgetting to, to do that on these videos as well. But this week, our college student of the week is my daughter, Aria. And I can't even believe to say she's a college student, but she is. And she actually turns 19 today on September 12th. I remember when she was, we, she was born. And, and so her address is in our church email for those of you who are at home. If you'd like to send her anything, I probably will. Um, but uh, be in prayer for Aria this, this week and all of our college students. All right. 
So those are our announcements for this day. And so now, if you would like to get your Bibles out, I'll go right into the sermon for this morning. And uh, we, I get to tell you the amazing story of Joseph today, uh, which I absolutely love. Um, his story begins in Genesis 37. Uh, if you would like to turn with me there. And just a quick recap of our series on the Old Testament so far. We've looked at creation. We've looked at the fall. We looked at Noah and the ark. And then last week we looked at Abraham and how he had to learn how to trust in God and how God promised that from him was going to become a nation, a people. Uh, as more numerous than the stars, and that he would bless them, and, and, and they would be a blessing uh, throughout the nations for that people would come to know the truth of God through them. Well, God gave Abraham and Sarah a child in their old age, and his name was Isaac. And Isaac would grow up and have a son, Jacob. And Jacob would have 12 sons, who would be called eventually the 12 tribes of Israel. And one of those 12 sons of Jacob was Joseph. And that's who we're going to look at today. Joseph was the next to youngest. He was number 11 of 12. Imagine being number 11 of 12. But his father, Jacob, liked him the best. And all the other sons could tell it. And they didn't like that very much. And they were jealous of Joseph. Their dad gave Joseph a richly ornamented robe. Um, and, and any father and mother knows you can't do that. You can't give one kid a gift and not give it to the others. But Jacob did that. He showed favor to Joseph. And when his brothers saw that, they hated Joseph all the more and couldn't speak a kind word about him. Well, what made Joseph's relationship with his brothers even worse was that God gave Joseph a dream. And in it, his brothers were bowing down before him. And of course, Joseph tells his brothers this dream. And so they hated him even more. He's the younger brother. How Eric could he be to think that they would kneel before him? Well, one day, Jacob asked Joseph to go and check on his older brothers who were out in the field. And so Joseph went, and we pick up our story in Genesis 37, Verse 17, where it says this. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. But they saw him in a distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come, let's kill him and throw him in one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. Well, when Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into this cistern in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him, Reuben said. He said this to try to rescue him and take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, his ornate robe he was wearing, and they took him and they threw him in a cistern. The cistern was empty and there was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm, and myrrh, and they were on their way down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Let's sell him to these Ishmaelites, not lay a hand on him. After all, he's our brother, our own flesh and blood. And so his brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants came by, the brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the cistern, saw that Joseph wasn't there, he tore his clothes. He went back to his brothers and he says, the boy is in here. What can I do now? And they got Joseph's robe. They slaughtered a goat, dipped it in the blood, and they took the ornate robe back to their father, said, we found this. This is your son's robe. He recognized it and he said, it is. Some ferocious animal must have devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. Jacob tore his robe, put on a sackcloth and mourned for his son many days. Now I'd like to get us each to think a little bit here as we begin thinking about Joseph's life. Think about some of the mean and cruel and horrible things that you have seen in our world. There are many. 
Sorry, to, I know it's not a pleasant thought. But this world can be a very mean place. Maybe you have sadly experienced some of that in your own life. And you wonder, how could a coworker have, have treated me like that? Or how could my friends have abandoned me like that? Or how could somebody do this horrific thing? And maybe you have uh, even caused pain to somebody you love as well. Well, in this story, um, how could the brothers have done that to Joseph, their brother? And, and not just, you know, to him, but they did it to their father as well. They hurt their dad badly. They made him think that his son was killed. And he mourned his son and had to live without him. But this world can be a really horrible place. Sin is real. Even in our own hearts, hate and greed and selfishness and jealousy can cause us to do terrible things. There is betrayal in this life. There are lies and, and there are people who will hate you and will tear you down just so that they could get ahead. This world is not always fair, not always kind, not always loving. This world can try to tear your dreams and steal your life. Well, this is how the story of Joseph begins. This is what literally happens to him. His own brothers betray him. They beat him. They reject him. They throw him into a pit. They sell him to traitors who are coming by. They rip up that beautiful robe given to him and that relationship he had with his father. They steal his life and tear his dreams apart. The story of Joseph begins with pain and with injustice. And chapter 37 ends with Jacob thinking his son is dead and Joseph being sold to a slave to Potiphar in Egypt. And that is the end of the chapter. That's it. In fact, chapter 38 of Genesis goes on to an entirely different story. If you're reading the Bible from the beginning and you don't know what happens, it appears that, well, that's the end of Joseph. <laughs> Joseph and his dream and life have just ended. Tragic story. That's it. That's what you're left to think as you go on to chapter 38 and it's an entirely different thing moved on. But it's not it. Just like when pain and sorrow come into our life and we begin to think, well, that's it. It's over now for me. It's not over. For we turn the page when you think that the story is done, it rises up. Just like in life, when you think all hope is gone and it's over, God says, nope, I got a plan for this. I'm going to redeem this. Wherever there is death, God brings new life. And so in Genesis 39, it begins with Joseph again. And listen to what it says. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites and had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph so that what he did prospered. And he lived in the house of the Egyptian master. When his master saw the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his entire household. He entrusted in his care everything that he owned. From the time he put him in charge of the house and all that he owned, the Lord blessed the house of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything that Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he didn't concern himself with anything except for the food that he ate. So now in telling the story of the Joseph, I am going to focus us here on three key verses that I think mean everything and should encourage every one of us today who feels that our dreams or our life have just been robbed by injustice or sin or hardship and you think it's over. And God says, no way, I'm not done with you. For Joseph's story is going to be one of redemption, of how when God is with a person, 
God stays with that person, even if the world turns their back on them. God is faithful. And God can take a man who's been thrown away into the pit and raise him up from the dead and put him in the palace. This is the incredible story and testimony of Joseph. From the pit to the palace. The I cannot believe God did that story. So three key verses I want to share with you. The first one is right here in Genesis 39 two, where it says, the Lord was with Joseph and he prospered. How come Joseph's story is not over? Because the Lord was with Joseph. How come in our life, when the worst possible thing could happen to us, just happens when people hurt us or evil comes, how come our life is not over? Because we have the Lord. And if he is for us, who can stand against? If the Lord is with us, then anything is possible for us. I might be down, but I am not out. The Lord was with Joseph. In fact, it says more than that. It says that he prospered in verse 2. And in verse 3, it says the Lord gave him success in everything he did. And so Potiphar kept putting him in charge of more and more. And in verse 5, it says the Lord even blessed the household of Potiphar because of Joseph. So the blessing of the Lord on Joseph's life rubbed off on those people around him. When God's working in your life, it's not just even going to be you, but your kids, your co-workers, your business, your church. It's all, all going to be blessed because God is working in your life. So the very first powerful thing we see in Joseph's testimony is that the Lord was with him and he prospered. He prospered because he had the Lord. Not because Joseph was awesome, but because God was. Listen to the promise in Romans 8, 28. It says, we know that in all things, God will work for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. That means that God is right now working in your tragedies and disappointments. This is our hope hope that we need in our heart. It doesn't mean that all things are going to turn out like we had planned, but it does mean that even when evil knocks you down and life beats you up and you end up in the pit or you end up in chains, the Lord has not abandoned you. He is with you and he is continuing to work in your life. Even if it's in the slave house or in prison, the Lord is with you. He's going to bless you. He's going to show favor to you and help you because he has a purpose for your life and a reason for all things that you you cannot see yet. So trust him, lean on him, and watch what God can do. And Joseph, for Joseph, God blesses his life even when he's a slave. And we read in Genesis 39 that Joseph obeyed the Lord. He did what was right even when it was difficult. And so when Potiphar's wife tries to seduce him, Joseph resists, and so Potiphar's wife, feeling that rejection, falsely, she does evil, she accuses Joseph of trying to rape her when he did the opposite. So Potiphar, but believes his wife, throws Joseph into jail. And so here it goes again, bad things happening. And this must have been a blow to Joseph. I mean, just when life starts turning around for you, you get back knocked down again. You've done nothing wrong. You even try to do what's right, but here we go again. Now you're in a dungeon. You're in prison. The blessing of the, word of the Lord does not mean the world is going to accept you or that the bad things aren't going to happen to you anymore. Because there are bad people in the world and sin still affects us and there is persecution. But the blessing of the Lord is that God never stops working in your life. We see this in Genesis 39, 20 and 21 where it says, So Potiphar took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But the Lord was with him, it says, and showed him kindness and granted him favor now in the eyes of the prison warden. So here we go again. Here's God again. 
Where the world tries to destroy, the Lord saves. The Lord redeems. His favor protects. His favor is on Joseph. And so just like at the slave house with Potiphar, so now in prison with the prison warden, the Lord blesses Joseph wherever he goes. In fact, it says in Genesis 39, 23, the Lord was with Joseph, gave him success, and whatever he did. Because we love the Lord doesn't mean that bad things won't happen. Jesus said, in this world, you're going to have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. Many unfair and unjust things may happen, as they did in Joseph's life. But they were never the last page. They weren't the end of the story. Because the Lord was with Joseph and kept writing a different ending. And it amazes me that we never read in this story of Joseph turning his back on God or complaining, God, why did this happen? Where are you? He may have thought those things. I'm guessing as a human being, he did. Maybe in the pit, maybe his first night in jail. But we're not told that. Instead, we read how God was with Joseph through all of his sufferings, redeemed his life, and eventually would use it to save others, which we'll come to see is what God's purpose was. Well, I need to hear this today because if I only look at my surroundings, the pit, the recent betrayal, the false accusation, the prison, it could look bleak and I could get bitter. I could find myself losing hope. But if instead I remember that my God is with me, and he's going to give me success in wherever I go. He is my redeemer. He is my savior, my hope all day long. Well, then things begin to change in my own attitude. Don't just look at what's been done to you. Look at how the Lord is redeeming it for a greater good. Look at how God has been faithful up to this point And know he's going to be faithful still. Look up to him. So the first verse I want us to see is that reoccurring line, you see. The Lord was with Joseph and he prospered. Time and time again it says that. Well, continuing on in the story, Joseph now in prison. And in prison, he ends up meeting the king's baker and cupbearer. For they did something out there. We don't know what, but they made the king mad. And so they were thrown into prison. And since Joseph was there, he met them. Well, one night, both the baker and the cupbearer have dreams that scare them. And in the morning, they wake up and they tell Joseph about him. And by the help of God, Joseph interprets their dreams. And sure enough, they come true. And so they tell him, when we get out of here, we're going to tell Pharaoh about you and try to get you out too. But they forget. And two years pass where Joseph is in that dungeon. Now, those are some long days and nights. But Joseph doesn't give up. And Pharaoh, after two years, has a dream of his own which concerns him. And he has all of Egypt <laughs> on alert. And he says, I need someone to help me interpret this dream and what it means. Well, just that time, the cupbearer remembers Joseph. So he runs and he tells Pharaoh about how Joseph helped him interpret his dream long ago. And so Pharaoh calls for Joseph and they unlock the prison doors. They clean up the man. They give him a shave because it's been two years. And they bring him before Pharaoh. And in Genesis 41, Pharaoh says, I heard you can interpret dreams. And now here's my second verse. Here's my second most important thing that's happening, going to happen here, I think, in Joseph's life. Uh, for Joseph... When Pharaoh says, I heard you can interpret dreams, Joseph doesn't say, well, yes, I can. No. In Genesis 41, 16, Joseph says, nope, I can't. But God can, and he will give Pharaoh what he desires. I think this is a major test and turning point in Joseph's life. Will Joseph give glory to God or himself in that moment? Will Joseph try to impress the king or trying to find a way out of his situation or fail to see who is truly working in his life? Joseph could have easily said, yes, I can, Pharaoh. Let me do it for you as long as you get me out of here and out of this jail. But Joseph says, no, I can't do it. But God can. I can't, but God 
can. Joseph gives all the glory to God. He says, I can't interpret your dream, but my God can. So imagine sitting there for two years rotten in a dungeon. And yet afterwards, the moment you have an opportunity, you give glory still to God. You still trust in him. You still exalt his name. That was Joseph. Jesus said in John 15, apart from me, you can do nothing. Joseph knew that. Joseph knew that the blessings and the good things in his life were not because of him or his hard work or abilities. It was all God. So Joseph gives the credit to the Lord. This is worship. This is looking back at our life and honestly seeing all that we have and everything that we have been given, every ability, every opportunity, and saying, man, God, that was you. That wasn't me. I don't deserve, but you have given me over and over again. It's looking forward in our life and being assured that it won't be because of us, <coughs> but because of him. Notice that Joseph not only admits that he can't interpret that dream, but he boldly says, but I know my God will. His confidence is strong, <clears throat> but not in himself, but in his Lord. He is confident in the Lord. He knows God. I love the story of Marilyn Sundin's father, Theodore Epp, who back in the 40s and 50s started Back to the Bible, the first radio broadcast of Bible teaching in Nebraska. And Mr. Epp was a young missionary and teacher, went uh, to that radio station, he said, I'd like to buy some time on your station. I notice you have all these other types of programs, but you don't have any Bible teaching yet. I'd like to provide that. And they said, well, it's going to cost this amount of money. And it was more than Theodore Epp had. And so he told his executives that he didn't have that yet, but he would go and talk to his partner and they would get the money right away. And the radio exec said, well, who's your partner? And Mr. Epp said, God. And the radio exec laughed. But within a week, Theodore Epp marched back in with all the money he needed. And what started in one city grew and prospered and entered hundreds of locations around the nation and the world. Back to the Bible took off. It's the same as Joseph. It's admitting, okay, I can't, but my God can. He's my partner. I got a partner and he can do it. I can do all things through him. This, this is how I'm going to live my life. This is how I'm going to face my problem and the challenges as they come up. I'm going to live in the humility and yet in the confidence that I can't, but my God can. So the first verse is, the Lord was with Joseph and he prospered. The second verse is, I can't. But God can. And then the final verse I want to share with you about Joseph is how God is going to restore that relationship with his family and his brothers. It happened this way. So Joseph says, I can't, but God can. So Pharaoh then shares his dream with him. Joseph interprets that dream with the help of God and tells him that seven years of abundance is coming, followed by seven years of famine. So get a wise man, put him in charge of the harvest, store away the grain for the first seven years so you're going to be able to make it through the seven years to follow. Well, Pharaoh believes this, and he sees the Lord at work in Joseph's life, and so he says, who's better to run this thing than you, Joseph? And so Pharaoh puts Joseph into a robe. Joseph is always getting robes. He puts him in a robe. He puts a ring on his finger like royalty, and he makes him second in command of all of Egypt. Joseph literally went from the prison to the palace in one day. He had been in the pit, and then he's been in prison, and we see now that they were only stepping stones to where God wanted him. And so Joseph ran the operations. He took one-fifth of the crops from the first seven years. He stored them away, and during that time, Joseph got married, settled down, had two kids. And then the famine hits, just like God said it would, and there was no, uh, no food coming up from the fields, but there was all this food in the grain bins that Joseph had saved. And so all the people came to him for grain, and he saved Egypt and others. Two years into the famine, we read in Genesis 42 how Jacob and Joseph's 11 brothers back in Canaan were hungry out of food. They're in the famine too. 
They hear there's food in Egypt, and so Jacob sends his sons to go to Egypt to buy some food. And they have no idea that Joseph is still alive or that he is now prince of Egypt. They probably thought he was dead. It had been over 12 years since they had seen their brother. And when they, though, arrive uh, to Egypt, they are brought before him. They don't recognize him. He comes in dressed like royalty. So what do they do? They bow just like in the dream. It comes to pass. They don't recognize him, but Joseph instantly recognizes them. In fact, he has to slip away because he's so filled with emotion. And I don't think Joseph knows what he's going to do yet. Is he going to take out revenge? Will he make them suffer for how they made him suffer? He's got the power now to do it. And I don't think he knows what he's going to do. And I don't have time to get into all the details of chapter 42 to 44. But I believe Joseph is wrestling with God on what to do. Just like, you know, us, when we can wrestle with God a while, whether or not we're going to forgive that person who harmed us. Or whether we're going to hold that grudge or we're going to get them back. I don't think Joseph knows right away what he's going to do. It takes three chapters for him to get there. But in those many months, I believe the Lord is working on Joseph's heart. And Joseph comes to accept a very powerful truth about his life. The sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God means that nothing happens without God being over it. And Joseph is now able to look back at his life and see all that happened to him with different eyes. And so he calls his brothers, and as they come and they stand before him, in Genesis 45, it says this. Joseph could no longer control himself before all of his attendants. He cried out, have everybody leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. He wept so loud, the Egyptians heard him, and Pharaoh's household heard all about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I'm Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were unable to answer because they were terrified at his presence. Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I'm your brother Joseph, the one you sent into Egypt. Don't be distressed. Don't be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For for two years, there's been famine in the land. For the next five years, there's going to be no plowing or reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth to save your lives by a great deliverance. And so it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, Lord of the entire household and ruler of Egypt. Joseph then goes on to tell him to go back and get the father and, and a whole series of things. And, and then in verse 14, it says, He threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept and embraced him. And he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. And afterwards, his brothers talked with him. It's the sovereignty of God that Joseph is able to now see and accept in that powerful speech, in verse 5, he tells his brothers, don't be distressed, don't be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. And in verse 8, so it was not you who sent me here, but God. And when he embraces his brothers, in that moment, Joseph is releasing them from his judgment and choosing mercy, choosing to see the hand of God, to see the sovereignty of God. And how even what his brothers intended for evil, God used for good to save lives. And I think when Joseph cries out here as we read so loud that all the palace could hear it, it's when he is finally releasing 10 years of built up pain that he had been carrying. This story makes me think of Jesus. And how he didn't just save a nation, but the whole world from sin. And he did it on a cross. But just like with Joseph, Jesus had to go through the rejection and the betrayal by Judas and the Pharisees. They are all like the brothers who did this evil intending to destroy him. 
when God in his sovereignty used their actions to accomplish the saving of many lives through him. Maybe that is why Jesus is able to cry out on the cross. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And so God allowed, he permitted the rejection of his son and the betrayal of, by Judas and the Pharisees and even the crucifixion because it was going to be there upon Calvary that God would save many lives. Friends, I, I can't make sense of how it all works, the sovereignty of God. I don't understand in our life all the why questions we have but somehow our God is able to work all things out for our good in his glory. Like he did for Joseph. I think of the powerful testimony of Joni Erickson Tata. And her words that have helped me understand this mystery a bit more. She was a young woman and such an athlete. Her whole life in front of her. And then she has this diving accident. And in a moment she becomes paralyzed. And she's lying there in the hospital. She's angry. She's scared. She's confused. She's feeling hopeless with tough questions about her future. And, and how could God allow this? And in her hospital, there a good friend by the name of Steve comes to visit her. And she's honest with her friend. She said, I always thought God was good, but here I am, a quadriplegic, sitting in a wheelchair for the rest of my life, feeling more like an enemy than a child of God. Didn't he want to stop this accident? Why didn't he stop it then? Could he have stopped it? Was he even there? She had all these questions that her friend had no answer for. But her friend Steve, who was Joni's age, was with her in the questions. He had never met a person his own age in a wheelchair. And he knew the Bible, but never had it tested like this. But God came over him, and he said to his friend Joni this radical sentence that she remembers and retells after all these years. He said to her, God put you in that chair, Joni. I don't know why. But if you will trust him instead of fighting him, you'll find out why. If not in this life, then in the next. He let you break your neck. And perhaps I'm here to help you discover at least a few reasons why. And then Joni said, her friend Steve paused for a moment and then said these words which would forever change her life. He said to her, God permits what he hates to accomplish what he loves. God permits what he hates to accomplish what he loves. Isn't that good? Isn't that summarize even Jesus on the cross? God permits what he hates to accomplish what he loves. Over the summer, Joni and her friend Steve would read the Bible together, wrestle with the big questions and search for the Lord in this mystery. In the book of Lamentations, it says in 323, God does not willingly bring affliction or grief, but within it he is showing his compassion. He's always moving, even in the bad stuff. And these are the deep waters that are too much for our finite minds to understand. But we dive into these waters where we find him in the suffering. For God permitted what he hated on the hill of Calvary to accomplish what he loved for you and me, salvation. This perfectly parallels our life in so many ways. Joni Erickson Tata would go on to inspire and heal and help so many people, leading so many to faith and salvation in Christ. And so her accident is like Joseph's story. Joseph saved many lives in Egypt. He saved his family in famine. He showed his brothers true grace and mercy of the Lord. Had he not gone through everything he did, he would not have been in a position where God could have used him as much as he did. Our life is for a reason. Every part of it, even the painful parts, have their purpose. Do not be distressed. Do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here. Because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. So then it wasn't you who sent me here, but God. 
Will you let God redeem your life? And your pain. So the first point, the Lord was with Joseph and he prospered. Second, Joseph had told Pharaoh he couldn't, but God could. And third key verse was when he caught a vision of the sovereignty of God and all that happened for a reason. God in control, working it for his purpose, and his purpose was to save lives. This is the place where we find the strength to release our pain and forgive our brother. This is the place where we begin to look upon our past and let God rewrite a new future. This is the place where we enter into the deeper waters and greater faith. So Joseph was reunited with his father Jacob after all those years. He was reunited with his brother. They were made one family again. And all of them moved to Egypt. And Pharaoh gave them all land. And this is how Israel ended up in Egypt, where they would thrive many years. And eventually, God would bring them back to the promised land. But not yet. That's next week's story. Have a wonderful day.